Hi, good morning, Grade 12. Today's lesson is on the strategic management process. This is still part of Business Strategies, Chapter 5. The first thing we're going to look at is the definition of a strategy. A strategy is a long-term plan of action to achieve a goal. Obviously, when we identify a challenge in this chapter, we are going to look at um, how all the tools that we can use to identify challenges for the business, and we need to overcome one of these challenges. We also always need a plan of action in order to reach our goals, in order to overcome the challenge. Right, so the plan of action to address an opportunity or to solve a problem. As I said, we're going to make use of different industrial analysis tools to identify the challenges that are posed to the business. And if there is a problem or a challenge that we have to overcome, obviously we need to come up with a plan of action as to how, what steps we are going to follow in order to solve this problem. When there's an opportunity that arises in the marketplace, we also need a plan of action as to how we are going to capitalize on this opportunity. The business needs a strategy to achieve its vision and mission. These are obviously the overall goals of the business. We cannot just hope to achieve our vision and mission if we're just falling about and everybody's just doing what they want. We need a very definite plan of action, and that is the reason why we formulate a strategy. We have to identify the different steps that we are going to follow in order to reach our goals. Right, so if we just look quickly at the steps in developing a strategy. First of all, as I mentioned, we are going to use our industrial analysis tools so that we can scan the business environment, and this is going to help us to identify should there be challenges or problems in our environment, and it will also help us to identify any opportunities that might exist in our environment. The different industrial analysis tools that we are going to look at this year is the SWOT analysis, we're going to look at PESEL, and then also Porter's Five Forces. Once we have scanned our business environments and we've come up with various opportunities and threats that exist in our environment, we obviously have to now formulate our strategies. Okay, so we've identified an opportunity or a problem. Now we need to have a plan of action, steps that we are going to implement in the business in order to either overcome this challenge or to make use of this opportunity. It is very important that we develop measurable strategic goals. A plan is also useless if we don't have a goal. Everybody needs to know what goal we are working towards and then the steps to reach that goal. After we have formulated a strategy, we are now going to choose the best strategy. Then we have to implement the strategy by making use of our action plans. So now we physically have to go over into action and physically implement what it is that we decided to do. Right, then we've spoken about this in the previous lesson as well. There has to be an evaluation of strategies, but this is not a step that comes only at the end of this development process. Obviously, we are going to evaluate our strategy throughout the implementation process. And basically, what evaluation is, is we need to compare the expected performance with the actual performance. So we need to see if our strategy is being successful. Are we reaching the goals that we have set for ourselves? So we are going to look at the actual, what is actually happening in the business. And then we're going to look at the goals that we hoped to achieve. For example, if we needed to increase our sales by 10%, we are going to look after the first month, okay, by how much did our sales increase. If it increased only by 2% and we aimed for 10%, obviously our strategy is not working and we have to adjust the strategy. We cannot carry on with the same strategy for five years if it is not working. Evaluation, the point of evaluation is to see if our strategy is actually working, if we should continue with the implementation of the strategy, or if we should rather come up with a new strategy that is going to help us to achieve our goals better. Right, we need to measure the business performance in order to determine the reasons for deviations. So once we have evaluated our strategy, we need to now see if there is a deviation, if we wanted a 10% improvement in sales and we only have a 2% improvement in sales, we need to analyze why, what is the reason that we are not meeting our goal. All right, because sometimes 
and we can identify the reason for this deviation, we can actually fix it. Okay? If we don't know what the problem is, we are not going to be able to fix it. So we need to see why is there this deviation, what is causing this deviation. Right, so if we look at the strategic management process, Okay, first of all, we have, need to have a clear vision, mission statement, and obviously measurable objectives. All right, the, by measurable objectives, we mean we have to, it must be able to measure whether we are reaching our goals or not. We can't just say we want to increase our sales. It has to be measurable. We want to increase our sales by 10%. We want to increase our market share by 5%. Okay, it has to be measurable objectives so that we know what we are working towards. Then we're going to identify opportunities, weaknesses, strengths and threats by conducting environmental scanning or doing a situational analysis. And this is where those industrial analysis tools are going to come in. Obviously the SWOT analysis, PESEL, and then Porter's Five Forces. This is what we are going to use to identify opportunities, weaknesses, strengths and threats in our environment. All right, so as I said, the tools available for environmental scanning, what we are going to focus on this year is the SWOT analysis, which you have done before, Porter's Five Forces, and then also the PESEL analysis. But any industrial analysis tools, these are just the focus of, of, uh, for us in grade 12. Right, once we have identified the opportunities and the weaknesses, the strengths and the threats that came out of our environment, we now have to formulate alternative strategies that we are going to use to respond to these challenges. Obviously, we are not going to choose just one strategy. We are going to use our creative thinking process and we are going to come up with alternative strategies so that we have different strategies to choose from. And then obviously, through the elimination process, we're going to try and choose the best strategy. But we don't just come up with one. We want different strategies so that we can choose the best one. Right, from our strategy, once we have our strategy, now we have to develop our action plan. We have to identify exactly which tasks has to be done, who are going to be responsible for completing those tasks. We are going to have to give people deadlines and we need to give them the correct resources that they need now to do their job. All right, so we split up the strategy into different action plans and we allocate our resources. We decide who is responsible for doing what and then give them deadlines. Okay, obviously, we, we have to give them a deadline so that they know by when their plan should be implemented. All right, and we have to obviously make sure that all the people that have been given a task have all the resources that they need to perform their job. Right, once we have an action plan and we know now who is going to do what and everybody has been allocated the right amount of resources, we now will implement the selected strategy. We will communicate it to all stakeholders, all the employees. We will um, have all the managers. We organize the business resources. We have to motivate staff. It is obviously very important that all the staff buys into our strategy if people do not believe in the strategy, they're not in favor of the strategy, they might actually work against each other because they don't support the strategy. So it's very important that managers will then motivate the staff and everybody participates in the implementation of this strategy. Right, and then as I said, as soon as we start implementing almost at the same time, we have to also start evaluating our strategies to identify if there are deviations in implementation. If we do not reaching our targets, evaluation is the process that we're going to find out why. Now, why are we not meeting our challenges? Why are not we not reaching our goals? What are the reasons for the deviations? Once we have identified that there are deviations and it was possible for us to identify the reasons, the factors causing this deviation, we need to take corrective action. We need to fix what is wrong. Otherwise, we are not going to reach our goals. Right, so if we now move over to the different industrial analysis tools, this is obviously very, very important for exam purposes. Right, the ones that we are going to look at, as I said before, is the SWOT analysis, the PESEL analysis, and Porter's Five Forces. And then we are also going to look at the different business strategies. Business strategies we're only going to focus on in the next lesson. 
All right, but all of this industrial analysis tools and the business strategies that we're going to look at in the next lesson both form part of the strategic management process. All right, obviously we need to identify the challenges first. That is what we use the industrial analysis tools for. And then we need to address those challenges or opportunities. That is what business strategies are there for. Right, so if we look at the SWOT analysis first, Right, now you've done this yo, since grade 9, you've been doing SWOT analysis. Right, if we just look, remember each letter stands for something. The S is for strengths, the W is for weaknesses, the O is opportunities, and the T is for threats. Strengths can be advantages that you have and things that you are able to do better than others as a business. It could be that you have access to unique resources access to resources that others might not have access to, or you can obtain these resources at a lower cost compared to everybody else. Right, one of your strengths can be a skilled employees. You have very skilled employees and a strong customer base. So you have existing customers that are loyal to your business. That'll be a strength. And skilled employees, skilled managers that know what they are doing. Very, very important strength. High quality products. Also, as a strength, if you have, uh, you are producing a high-quality product that is able to compete with others on the market because of its good quality, that is a strength. Having sufficient resources, so you do not face shortages in terms of your raw materials. You have enough workers. You have enough financial resources. You have enough factory space. You have your own a factory. Anything like that can be part of your strengths. Okay, it is basically your core competencies, those things that you as a business can do really well. Right, your weaknesses, for example, can be the high cost of infrastructure. You have to pay a lot of money for internet connections, data costs, transport, all of that is part of infrastructure. A high employee turnover is a very, very big weakness. Every single time that there's a, a worker that resigns or that you dismiss for whatever reason, you have to replace that person and that person has to undergo training. Okay, They don't know what's happening in your business. A high employee turnover is a very big weakness. A weak brand portfolio, so your customers or people out there are not really aware of your brand. Um, your product is not favored by the customers. High debt levels, obviously if you had to borrow a huge amount of money to start your business, those debts have to be repaid, so this will eat into your profits, and this will diminish your ability to make a profit because you still are repaying your debts. Right, things that your market sees as weaknesses, so anything that your suppliers or your competitors or your customers see as a weakness in your business, any factors that can cause a loss of sales. Anything that your competitors in the market is able to do better than you, it will be a weakness. Right, if we move over to the opportunities then, opportunities is, for example, if your market is growing, if you have advertised and your advertising have been successful because you can see that more customers are starting to buy your product. There's an increase in the demand for your product. If new technology comes available on the market that is going to enable you to produce more, to increase your productivity, to um, produce more in a given period of time at a lower cost, any new technology will be an opportunity should you be able to acquire this technology. Changing customer habits, okay, if you are for example, into health food or whatever, and the, the general movement out there is for customers to want to be more healthy, obviously this is an opportunity for you that you can grab so that you can increase your market share. Increase in disposable income of your customer base. If your customers are earning more money, obviously they have more money to spend and that will enable you, obviously, to sell more. It's an opportunity. Any government incentive that is coming your way, if the government is offering subsidies or whatever, that is an opportunity for you to decrease your production cost. More people buying online creates an opportunity for you to start selling online. And then it'll include any good opportunities that you can spot. Anything that you can capitalize on 
that is out there happening in the market that is an opportunity for you that will enable you to increase your sales. Right, on the other hand, the threats, increased corporate tax okay, by the government. Remember, every year in the budget, the government can adjust the corporate taxes that businesses have to pay. So if the government decides to increase corporate tax, obviously this is a threat to you. There's nothing you can do about it. You are going to have to pay the higher taxes, and that obviously is going to eat into your profits. Higher wages is a threat. The more you have to pay your workers, obviously the less profit you are going to make. It is a threat that you're going to have to deal with. Strong competition, competitors selling similar products than you is always a threat, especially if their product is a good substitute for yours. And then it can happen that your consumers actually start buying the product of the competitor. That would be a threat. New entrants into the markets as well. Any new business entering the market is a potential threat for you as well. Increasing fuel prices obviously is going to impact also on your production cost. If you have to pay more for fuel, it'll increase your production cost and that will enable you to make less profits. An aging population obviously means also that if your customer base is getting older and older, there is going to come a point obviously where they are no longer going to be there and then you need to find yourself a new customer base. That is a threat. Stricter environmental laws, obviously, that will um, impact on your business as well. If there's stricter laws, it will make it very difficult for you in your production process, especially if you produce a lot of pollution in your production process. It will make it more difficult for you to be compliant with environmental laws. If you have to find new production methods, for example, in order to comply with these laws, it's a threat to you because it's going to impact on your production process. You are going to have to adjust your production process. Fluctuations in the currency, especially if you are involved in imports and exports. Obviously, every single time the value of the rand is changing, if you are importing, obviously what you are paying for those imported parts or imported raw materials is going to change. And if you are exporting, what you are earning is going to change. So if there's very severe fluctuations in the currency, like we are witnessing now with the coronavirus, obviously the value of the RAND, the RAND has depreciated quite significantly over the last week or so. And that means that what if you are importing raw materials, for example, it is going to cost you more in order to pay for those imports. And that is going to impact on your production cost. Your production cost is going to increase and that is going to ultimately decrease your profitability levels. Right, changing technology can be a threat if you do not have access to those changing technology. If others have access to technology that you don't, that is a threat. Technology makes it possible then for the others to be more productive and to produce a better quality product than you. Right, what is very important is that you must remember from a scenario, you're going to be given a scenario and you are going to be asked to identify the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats. Always remember that your strengths and your weaknesses you find inside the business. Is this something that you have or don't have in your business? And this is things that you have control over. Your opportunities and threats comes from outside the business. It is those things that the business have no control over, but they have to come up with strategies to deal with these factors. But remember, it is not something from within the business. It comes from outside the business, things that we have no control over. Right, if we just look at an example quickly. Okay, the example is Dave's Digital Sound or DDS. DDS specializes in selling radios and car sound systems. They employed qualified sound engineers. The business does not have sufficient capital to buy and sell sound systems that cater for large events. Businesses in the same industry are closing down due to ineffective marketing campaigns. DDS is located in a high crime area. Right, so if we identify the strengths and the weaknesses, Remember, these have to be things that the business have control over. Right, first of all, it says in the case study that DDS employs qualified sound engineers. It is a strength. They have qualified sound engineers that will be able to do their job well. 
And then secondly, they specialize in the selling of radios and car sound systems. They're already in there. They have capabilities in this field. The weaknesses, in the case study it says, the business does not have sufficient capital. They don't have money to buy and sell sound systems that cater for your larger events. Obviously, that is a weakness because it is something that they cannot do. Right, the opportunities, businesses in the same industry are closing down due to ineffective marketing campaigns. For us, this is an opportunity because businesses that are closing down, their customers are going to be looking to substitute and we can suck up those customers of the businesses that is busy closing down. The threats, something that we cannot control that will negatively impact on our business DDS is located in a high crime area. Okay, for us, this is a threat. Obviously, they can, if there's thefts or whatever, they can come and steal our stock. That is a threat for us. Right, if we move to the second industrial analysis tool, this is Porter's Five Forces. Very important for you to remember that Porter's Five Forces model is not focusing on the strategies to overcome the forces. The idea here is to analyze the position of the business in the market. We are trying to identify the problems, the challenges that is in our market environment, in, our, in the business environment. So the focus is not on the formulation of a strategy. The idea is not to come up with solutions to the problems, but we have to identify the problem. So the main aim of Porter's Five Forces model is to analyze the position of the business in the market and to identify challenges that might be there. It is a research study done by the business. The business wants to see what its position in the market is. Right, so do not focus here on recommendations. The idea is not to fix the problem. The idea is just to identify the problem. All right, and very important, you must correctly name these. So the, four, the five forces, Porter's five forces, you cannot change the order of the words. Right, so you can't say supplier's power, for example. You have to use it just as it appears here because it is names. It is the name of the forces. So we are going to look at the power of suppliers, the power of buyers, the power of competitors, the threat of substitution, and the threat of new entrance to the market. So we are basically going to use these five forces to analyze what is the position of our business in the market. Right, so if we look at the very first one, the power of suppliers. A business must assess the power of their suppliers to influence prices. So the focus here is we need to see how, how powerful are our suppliers. Is it possible for our suppliers to influence prices? And generally, suppliers that have a high quality product, they might have power over the business. People are always going to look for a better quality product. All right, so we want to see how powerful our suppliers are in terms of the influence that they have over the price. The more powerful the suppliers, the less control our business have over them. All right, so if we determine in the market that there are some of our suppliers that have a lot of power in the market, they supply a high quality product and they can influence prices, they can push prices up, for example, we as a business, we are not going to have much control over that. If our suppliers do decide to increase their prices, we are going to have to pay more for the raw materials that we obtain from those suppliers. Right, the rule of thumb, the smaller the number of suppliers, the more powerful they may be. All right, because if there's only a small number of suppliers, we as a business don't have a wide variety of different suppliers to choose from. So if supplier A decides to push their prices up, if there is only two others, where there's only like three suppliers, it is very easy for the three of them to push their prices up, and us as a business don't have other choices of suppliers. If there's lots and lots, if there's like hundreds of different suppliers, if one supplier puts their prices up, it is easy for our business then to find a different supplier, if there are many. But if there's only a small number of suppliers, 
that gives them more power to influence the prices because they know we don't really have another option. We have to buy from them because there's only a small amount of suppliers. All right, so it's very important for us to determine the kind of power that our suppliers have in terms of the quality of the products that they sell, their service delivery, okay, do, do they deliver on time, do they make deliveries, do they charge for deliveries, are they reliable, do when they say they're going to deliver on Friday, do they actually deliver on Friday. It's very important to identify how powerful our suppliers are. Right, the second one of Porter's forces is the power of buyers. Right, very important. Buyers buying in bulk can always bargain for their prices. Okay, so now we're looking at the other side. From the suppliers, we have to buy from suppliers. If we look at the buyers now, the buyers are the people that are buying from us. All right, so anybody that is buying from us, normally when a buyer buys in bulk, in other words, they buy large quantities of something, then they always want to receive a discount. Yeah, then they want to bargain for a lower price because they are buying so much of it, they expect to almost pay a lower price. So it's very important for us that we know who our buyers are. So we need to conduct market research to get more information about who our buyers are. All right, if our business is dealing with a few powerful buyers, again, same rule of thumb, the less buyers there are, the more power they have over the terms on which they do business with the business. So if, there's, if we literally only have a few clients, few very powerful clients, obviously that is going to give them a lot of power. We are going to have to keep that limited buyers that we have, we have to keep them happy. All right. If buyers can do without our product also, we have to measure how necessary our product is for the buyers. If our product is a necessity, obviously buyers have to have our product and that gives them less power for negotiation. But if our product is, for example, a luxury item that buyers can totally do without, they can stop buying from us. If we are not willing to negotiate the price, if we are not willing to drop the prices at their request, they are simply going to decide not to buy the product. It is in their right to do so because it is a luxury item. It is not something that they absolutely have to have. All right, so again, the idea here is for the business to assess how easy it is for the buyers to drive prices down. Okay, because if the buyers drive the prices down, if buyers pay lower prices, we are receiving less money. Our revenue is going to drop. So we need to ascertain exactly how powerful our buyers are. Do they have the ability to force prices down or not? All right, this will depend again on the number of buyers. As I said, the more buyers we have, the less powerful each individual buyer is going to be. The smaller amount of buyers is going to give them more power. Obviously, also, you'll see I've referred here to the cost of switching to other products. We are going to talk about the threat of substitutes separately, but if there are substitutes available, our customers can physically switch to another product and that will reduce our buyers. It gives them more power. Right, so the third um, forces, first five, Next force is the power of competitors. Okay, what is the power that our competitors have over us? All right, so competitive rivalry refers to the number of competitors. How many competitors are there and how is there, what is their ability to influence the market? All right, same as always, the rule of thumb, the smaller the number of competitors, the more power they have over the prices in the market. All right, if competitors have a more unique product, then they will have greater power. If there's something that makes their product different to our product, they can bank on that and they can convince people to buy their product because it is unique, because it is different, even if they are selling at a higher price. All right, so a business with many competitors, as I said, the more competitors there are in the market, the less power each individual competitor will have. 
because there's many, many to compete with. Okay, so for example, if I increase my prices, if there's many other competitors, my customers are going to stop buying from me because my prices are now too high because there's lots of other competitors who sell similar products that they can switch to. That it's not necessary for them to pay my higher prices. Obviously, there's only a few competitors. It is more difficult for my customers to change. So if I push up my prices, they will generally keep buying my product because they don't really have other competitors to choose from. All right, so many competitors, more competition. It means less power. All right, so it's important for us as a business to draw up a competitor's profile. We need to know exactly who our competitors are and we need to watch what they are doing. We need to see what is our own strength in this market and what is the strengths of our competitors. All right, some businesses literally have necessary resources to start a price war and then continue selling at a loss until they force competitors out of the market. Literally, a price war works as follows. If I am in the market for donuts and Ms. Berger is in the market for donuts and I have a lot of financial backing, so what I will do is I will decrease my donuts. Let's say I'm selling my donuts for at a price for, of 10 rand, that my, my, me and Ms. Berger, we sell at 10 rand. Then I decide, right, I would like to take Ms. Berger out of this market. If I have a lot of financial resources, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my price down to 9 Rand and then all Ms. Berger's customers are going to come and start to buy my donuts. So she's going to be forced to decrease her price as well in order to stay in the market. So let's say she takes her price down to 8 Rand. Now obviously all my customers is going to go to Ms. Berger because her donuts are now cheaper and in order to survive I have to take my prices now down to 7 Rand. Again, if I take my price to 7 Rand, Ms. Berger's customers is going to switch to my donuts. And this process will continue. Ms. Berger takes her price to 6 Rand. I take my price down to 5 Rand. Eventually, both of us are selling at a loss. Okay, the price goes 5 Rand, 4 Rand, 3 Rand, 2 Rand. Eventually, we're selling our donuts for 1 Rand only. Both of us are making losses. That is called a price war. Eventually, one of us will not be able to continue to bear those losses and Ms. Berger will close her business. Once her business is closed, I have now forced my competitor to leave the market. I am now left as the only person selling donuts and immediately now I can push my prices all the way back up 15 to 15 Rand, more than what it was originally. Okay? That is a price war. In a country, it is illegal, but just because it's illegal doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. All right, a business with strong financial backing can always initiate this price war in order to force their competitors out of the market so that ultimately they are left with a whole lot of power in the market. Right, the fourth force for Porter is the threat of substitution. All right, now we said that substitute products are products that, that satisfy the same need. Consumers are either going to use the one or they are going to use the other one. Right, so substitute products are products that satisfy exactly the same need and they replace one another. All right, now what we need to do is we need to know who our competitors are and our competitors, the substitute products that they are selling, if the quality of their product is better than ours and what are their prices. All right, so we need to determine what is the quality of their goods and what is the price that, they've, that they are selling at. If they have improved their product, they've improved the quality of their product at a lower price, obviously this is a threat to us. We are also going to have to improve our product and we're also going to have to decrease our price. Now, the rule of thumb is the more substitutes there are and the better those substitutes are, the less power the business will have in the market. If I'm selling burgers and there's lots and lots and lots of substitutes, okay, if I'm wimpy, right, and then the, the, uh, my substitutes can be a Steers burger or a Spur burger or the cafe on the corner kind of burger, the more other burgers there are, the more difficult it would be for me. If I increase my prices, 
my customers are no longer going to buy from me because they're not going to buy from me because there's lots of other businesses that they can buy from instead. They're going to buy a Steers burger or a Spur burger or a whatever burger instead. The more substitutes there are, the easier it is for my customers to choose a substitute product, the less power I will have in the market. Those other substitutes are a threat to me. All right, so substitute products can even cause the business to completely lose its market share. If people's tastes changes, if they don't like a Wimpy Burger anymore, they are rather going to buy Steers Burgers or Burger King Burgers or McDonald's Burgers or whatever, I can potentially lose my entire market share because the threat is there. All right, unique products are not threatened by substitute products. So if my product is unique in a way that makes it different from other substitutes on the market, I have less of a chance to lose my customers. If, for example, I have a special sauce that I put on, a special mayonnaise or a special ingredient that I add onto my burgers that makes it different than my competitors, even if I put the prices up, because they prefer my product, because it is different, it is unique, they will not switch to a substitute. That makes me more powerful. It gives me more power in the market. All right, so it's very important that a business does market research to assess the reasons for customers using substitutes. So if we are losing market share because people are substituting our product, they're buying other burgers instead, it is very important that we research to find out why. What is it that makes customers prefer the substitute product because we need to fix it and we need to improve our product to bring our customers back? Right, the last one, the last um, of the five forces is the threat of new entrants into the market. Right, remember we said new entrants into the market are businesses that are entering our market for the first time. So if I'm sticking with the burger example, if there's a new business that is going to enter the market for a very first time, all right, Sunny starts selling Sunny's burgers in my market for the first time. It is a new substitute that is entering the existing market for the first time. Obviously, the power of new entrants will, de will depend on how easy it is to start a new business in this market. If it's very easy for a business to enter into the market, if there's freedom of entry, obviously then the threat is big. It will be possible for anybody, Yanni, Pitti, Sunny, anybody, can then enter into this industry with their own burger. All right, so new competitors can very easily enter the market if there's no restriction. All right, so if it doesn't require a huge capital outlay, for example, it's relatively cheap. Anybody with like 50,000 Rand can enter into this industry. It is easier to enter the, into the industry compared to if a person should need a million Rand to enter the industry. Now, their entry will be restricted because not many people will have a million Rand to enter the industry. All right. So if it's relatively cheap and relatively quick for somebody to enter this into this industry, the threat is there. Okay? There is a threat of new competitors. If there's only a few suppliers but many buyers, it can also be easy to enter the market because the, 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 there's a gap in the market. There's only a few suppliers trying to satisfy the needs of many, many, many buyers. So it is an opportunity there. If there are no other restrictions, it will be easy for others to enter this market. If the business is highly profitable, this is the sign for others to want to enter into our market. Everybody starts a business because they want to make a profit. So in the industry currently, if all the, the businesses selling burgers are highly profitable, they're making huge amount of profits, this will be a flashing light asking others to enter the market because other people will want to make a profit too. So potential competitors will want to enter this market. If there's no restrictions, it will then be easier for them to enter the market. What makes it more difficult to enter a market is, for example, legal requirements or patent rights or laws by the government. Yeah, that can make entry more difficult. 
But if there are no restrictions at all, anybody that wants to enter can enter. It does serve as a threat to our business. All right, so if barriers to entry into the market is low, barriers to entry are restrictions imposed on people wanting to enter. As I said, if a person has a patent right registered, it is impossible for others to enter the market. If the government made a law or there's a licensing requirement, if you need a license, for example, to sell liquor, only people with a license can enter the market. So there's not freedom of entry. There's a barrier to enter the market. But if there's only a few or no barriers to enter the market, obviously then this is a real threat to businesses in, in the market already because it will be easy for other businesses to enter this industry. All right, the last one, the last industrial analysis tool is the PESOL analysis. Again, PESOL is used to identify factors in our external environment that can influence the business. In the exam, you must be able to identify the PESOL factor from a scenario, and then you need to be able to make recommendations. All right. So if we look at the, the factors in the PESOL analysis, also, again, same as with Fortis Five Forces, make sure that you are able to name and identify the PESOL factors from a given scenario, and it must be word for word. All right, so the factors that we are going to look at is political factors, economic factors, social factors, technological factors, legal factors, and environmental factors. Right, so if we start with the political factors first, okay, you'll see on the slides that we're going to identify different challenges and then we're going to make recommendations. So if we focus on the challenges first, some government policies may affect businesses. And again, remember, we have no control over the policies that government uses, but we can obviously choose how we are going to react to these policies, how we're going to deal with it. All right. Consumer rights organizations might also prevent businesses from selling products if they do not meet certain requirements. And trade agreements that our government has with other countries may also prevent businesses from importing certain products. All right, obviously any agreement that the state enters into, also we have to abide by. So if the government, for example, has a trade agreement with China that we are going to import from them, then obviously we will not be allowed to produce or we might be forced to import certain things from China. We will not be allowed to import it from Argentina, for example. Okay, Any trade agreement that the government entered into is binding on the business as well. Right, the recommendations. Obviously, it is important for us to do research on government policies. We need to know that the government have introduced a new policy and we need to understand the implication of that on the business. Also, we need to network and lobby with non-government organizations and consumer rights organizations. Obviously, if we are in contact with these organizations and we listen to what they say, we will not have a problem in the first place. If we know, for example, that there is a movement towards anti-animal cruelty, we are not going to be testing our products on animals because that would be stupid, right? Because then the consumer rights organizations is going to prevent us from selling our products. They're going to make a big hoo-ha. They're going to get everybody to turn against us. So we need to know what the focus is on and we need to comply with that. All right, then trade only with countries that have favorable trade agreements with the government. As I said, any agreements that the government entered into is binding on the business as well. The second factor is our economic factors. Obviously, any changes happening in the economy is also something that we do not have any control over, but it is important for us to be able to react to changes in the economy in the appropriate way. Right, so the challenges, it could be that there's inflation, right? So a high inflation rate obviously is going to mean that the prices of everything is basically going to increase. So our raw materials is going to increase Potentially, there's going to be wage negotiations. Our workers are going to want higher wages. All right. 
So any inflation rate is very important for us to know what it is, to look at what the government thinks it's going to be in the future so that we can react to this in advance. Same with interest rates. Okay, obviously, if we have loans, business loans that we have to repay, any increase in the interest rate is going to mean that our repayment, our monthly repayment is going to increase. It is going to decrease our profits. All right. So any loan becomes more expensive because there's a higher interest rate. Okay, fluctuations in the exchange rates. I referred to this earlier. Obviously, currently now, as I said, the exchange rate, the RAND, is depreciating at an alarming rate. And in the minute that the RAND becomes weaker, if we are importing stuff from other countries, immediately it becomes way more expensive for us to import those items. And if it is a raw material that we are importing, for example, that we use in our production process, that is going to mean that our production cost is going to increase and our selling prices potentially are going to have to increase as well. All right, so the recommendations then quickly. When there's a high inflation rate, when there's a depreciation in the exchange rate that is causing our production costs to increase, sometimes it might be better for the business to decrease our profit margins. We are obviously going to want to increase our prices because if our production cost increases, we want to our selling price to increase so that we can still make a profit. But the minute we increase our prices, obviously we are going to lose customers. They can no longer afford to buy the product at the higher price. So sometimes it is better to rather decrease our profit margins, maybe not make 50% profit, maybe make only 40% profit, rather keep the prices the same and actually sell something and still make a little bit of a profit. Obviously, when we want to borrow money, also we shop around. You do not accept the first business loan that is offered to you. You look at different financial institutions and you go with a financial institution that is offering you the most favorable, the lowest interest rates. And then very important, we have to look at the exchange rates. When we trade with other countries, sometimes it is just not profitable to import any of our raw materials at a time when the RAND is very weak. If it is possible for us then to make a different solution, to come up with a different solution, to find another supplier rather, we should actually consider doing that. Right, the third factor is our social factors. Here we're going to look obviously at our customer base. All right, customers may not be able to afford our products due to a low income level or high unemployment. Currently, for example, because of the coronavirus, there will be people that are having to stay at home and they don't get paid because they're not at work. So their income levels are lower. People are going to lose their jobs. Okay, So we are potentially going to lose customers because if they don't have money, they can't afford our product. Right, it can also be a problem if businesses are not conversant with the local language of our customers. Okay, So if we are in an area where, for example, people are not really conversant in English, and we have nobody in the business that can actually communicate with their customers in the local language of their choice, that is potentially a problem. Some customers may prefer to spend their money on medical bills for the treatment of chronic illnesses. So again, they might not have money to afford our product, especially if our product is not a necessity, if it is a luxury item that is optional. Crime rates might also affect the trading hours of a business. So, for example, if we the business is situated in a very high crime area, it might be very difficult for us to actually operate, let's say, after 5 o'clock. All right, maybe it's safer for us then to close down our business at 5 o'clock and lock all the doors or whatever to prevent crime happening later in the, in the day. All right, so it just makes it difficult for us to operate late during late hours or at night or whatever if the crime rate is really high. The risk is just higher. Okay, so recommendations. If the consumers are no longer able to afford our product, we can look at rather selling a substitute or a generic product that might be available at a lower price. So we might just stock a different product that has a lower price, even though the quality might not as good. And then in terms of the languages, obviously it is important that we learn the local language or we just employ 
in people that are actually conversant with the local language. We need to be able to serve our market. So it is very important that we identify what the local languages are and that we do have people in the business that can assist our customers in their language of choice. Right, the next factor we're going to look at is the technological factors. Okay, the challenges is we may not keep up with or be aware of the latest technology. Nowadays, technology changes very, very quickly, but technology is also very expensive. So in our business, we might not have the latest technology that we are using in our business because either we cannot afford it or we're just not aware that it even exists. It could also be a problem if we have employees that are not skilled, they have not been trained how to operate the new equipment. If we've implemented new technology, we've implemented a new machine, but our workers are not really, they don't know how to use the equipment. Neither. We've never trained them. They're completely, they don't know how this equipment works. Okay, I already mentioned businesses might not be able to afford new technology. And lastly, they might not be able to cater for online transactions. Not every business is geared for online transactions. And many customers nowadays, especially now with the coronavirus again, people prefer to order their stuff online and have it delivered for them. So if your business is not doing online transactions, they're not making deliveries, it could be a challenge. It is something that you are not doing that people are looking for. All right, if we look at the recommendations, obviously it is very important you know what field your business is in, that you do continuous research on the latest technology. You cannot be caught sleeping that everybody else is aware of technology that exists and you are the only people that just doesn't know that this technology actually exists. Okay? It is your responsibility to be aware of what is happening in your industry. Also, if you implement new equipment, training is the solution. If your employees do not know how to use the equipment, it is your responsibility to train them or to get somebody to come and train them on how to use the new equipment. It is a safety hazard if they don't know how to use it. All right, and you can only use it effectively if they know how to use it. Right, also very important to compare prices and select suitable suppliers of this equipment. Again, you don't have to buy the equipment from the first person that tries to sell it to you. You shop around. You find a supplier that will supply you this equipment at the lowest cost. And then obviously you need to do what you can to do the online training. Okay, If you have to hire more people that are more conversant with internet transactions, but you need to up your game. Right, if we look at the legal factors then quickly, obviously there are various acts. We've looked at a lot of those acts in Chapter 1 that have a direct impact on the business. Now, like the Consumer Protection Act, the National Credit Act, Basic Conditions of Employment, Labor Relations, all of those acts that we looked at in Chapter 1, we have to be compliant. It's a challenge, right? All of those laws impose a challenge for us. There are certain things that we need to do in order to be compliant with these acts. Every new law that the government introduces presents a challenge for us. All right, the legal requirements for operating certain types of businesses are also time-consuming. There are certain types of businesses that have extra requirements, like, for example, a license. If you have to apply for your license, whatever, that can be time-consuming. Um, if you want to try and obtain the license or if you want to register a patent on your product, Obviously, that involves high legal costs. You have to get a lawyer in to register this patent or to register your license, apply for this license. It is an increased cost. It is a cost. It's a challenge. It is something that you have to pay for that is going to reduce your profit. Also, your business contracts. We've spoken about contracts in Chapter 1 as well. There's a huge amount of requirements that you have to comply with before any kind of business contract is seen as legal. So it's very important that you have somebody in the business that can actually go over the business contracts to make sure that they are compliant. All right, so business contracts, it is a challenge to you to set up business contracts that will be upheld in court. Right, the recommendations, obviously we have to comply with all relevant legislation. We've done the laws, we have to know which laws are applicable to us 
and we have to be compliant with all of them. We have to comply with any legal requirements. If a license is required to sell liquor, for example, we cannot go and sell liquor without a license. Then we are not compliant. So if we have to have a license, we have to follow the procedures and we have to pay and we have to obtain those licenses. Right, also budget for high legal establishment costs. Okay, we obviously need to budget for unforeseen things. Right, if there's something going to happen in the future, we have to make sure that we put money aside for those things. And very important, as I said, that we have somebody at the business, we need to employ somebody at the business that have legal knowledge of business contracts so that they can make sure that all of our business contracts are actually compliant with contractual laws. Otherwise, it is going to be a huge problem. Remember, fines and the, the court is not going to uphold this contract. Our customers can pull out of this contract if it's not legal, and there will be nothing that we can do about that. All right, so make sure that we do appoint somebody that actually knows the law, knows the legalities of contracts. Specifically, it's a very, very specialized field, and they need to know what they are doing so that they can write and come up with legal contracts that will stand in a court of law. Right, the last factor we're going to look at is the environmental factors. Okay, challenges on the challenges side. Sometimes certain ingredients that we use in our products could be harmful to consumers. Um, the measures to dispose of business waste might be expensive. Obviously, if there's environmental laws that we have to comply with, we cannot just dump our waste in the closest river or on a land site or whatever. Obviously, we have to dispose of it responsibly, and that is expensive. The packaging of some of our products might not be environmentally friendly. All right, plastic, for example, that's a big focus area now. Okay, if it's not environmentally friendly, if it's harmful to the environment, if it's not recyclable, that is a challenge. In terms of recommendations, obviously we have to comply with the law. All ingredients must be indicated on our labels and packaging. Remember, that's part of the Consumer Protection Act as well. We have to indicate every single ingredient on the label and the packaging so that when consumers choose to buy our product, they are making an informed decision. If there's any potentially harmful ingredients, it has to say so on the package. It has to inform customers about any possible side effects and what the correct use of products are. So, for example, if you're selling cleaning products and there's dangerous chemicals in your cleaning products, you have to say on the packaging, don't drink this. This is for external use or whatever. All right. And as you list all of those potentially dangerous products. Like, for example, if you sell sweeties and your sweeties contains nuts, nuts can be harmful to certain consumers that are allergic. So on your packaging, you have to state this product contains nuts. It is a legal requirement. Right. Implement cost-effective measures to dispose of medical waste. As I said, we have environmental laws. There are correct and incorrect ways to dispose of your waste. Even if it costs you more, you have to dispose of your waste in a responsible way. Right, in terms of your packaging, if it's not environmentally friendly, you have to change your packaging, right? Use packaging that is either reusable or recyclable so that you reduce the impact of your packaging on the environment. Also implement recycling measures to prevent pollution from the environment. You as a business must take initiative and implement recycling measures. For example, you can insist that your customers bring the packaging back. You can create a bin, a recycling bin at the front of your shop where people can come and dispose of anything that is recyclable. So they can, so when they've used your product and they need to get rid of the packaging, they can also do that in a responsible way so that we reduce the impact on the environment.